Greetings and welcome to our first ever Bible study on demand. We thank you so much for joining with us as we do a new thing here at Allen Temple as we seek to bring you the Word of God for your midweek study in a completely different way. We're so excited to be here this evening with our friend, our colleague, the Reverend Dr. Richard Allen Washington, who is a son of this church, as we present this study not only on behalf of Allen Temple, but in conjunction with our sister church, St. John AME Church on Steam Mill Road. We are so excited to have you, and thank you for joining with us today. As we get ready to do this study, I want to kind of lay out the format for you so you understand exactly what we're doing, why we are doing it, and, and what you can expect. We understand that we're living in a new normal, this is a new age, and we're trying to make sure that we meet the needs of the present age. And so for that reason, we're delivering this study to you in a way that will hopefully be much more convenient and meaningful, allowing you to participate at a time of your church. We watch everything on demand now. We hardly ever watch TV shows and everything when they actually come on live. We now watch them on demand, and we want to be able to present that same thing to you in Bible study. We realize that some people work at different times and may not be able to tune in on our schedule, and so we want to be able to give it to you when it meets your schedule. So you'll be able to get these. These will premiere every Wednesday at 6 p.m. is when they'll be available for public consumption. But after that, you'll be able to get it at any time of your choosing, whether it be via the St. John YouTube channel, whether it be through the Allen Temple YouTube channel, or the Facebook Live page. The same message, that, the same manners, rather, that same mediums that you use to get our Sunday worship, you'll be able to find the, the online Bible study on demand there as well. Now, we recognize that that comes with some limitations, right, that this is not a live interactive thing with you. Uh, we realize that there are trade-offs whenever we do something like this. And so we do want to still be able to get your feedback. Hopefully, the interaction will be good enough for you to be able to at least get some questions, get some answered, and keep you engaged. But we realize that there will probably be some things that will happen that you'll understand that I get it, but I want a question or to go further detail into that. And so for that reason, we do want to give you the opportunity to reach out and engage us. And you'll be able to use just the simple email address. You can email it directly to me, to the email address on your screen, pastor at Allen Temple AME, Allen Temple Columbus, I'm sorry, allentemplecolumbus.org. And you'll be able to get that right there. Send your messages, send your questions. And if we aren't able to answer it at the next session, we'll have a time when we do get back to answer your questions. So we're excited about that. That's what you can expect. So today, what I want to do is really jump right into this and really engage you, Dr. Richard Allen Washington, in this study, Scandals in the Sacred. We are talking about some salacious stuff, scandals in the Bible. And we don't typically think about that, right? right. Scandals in the Bible. So before we, we jump into it, just help us, help, help the viewers to understand what led us to this. How do we get to this moment where we're talking about scandals in the sacred? Well, one thing that led us to um, this wonderful opportunity to engage you, a family of faith in scripture, is the need to uh, help all of us identify with God in relationship. The biblical narrative, the Bible, invites us weekly, daily, to engage with God. And when we focus on only the good things, so quote unquote, the good things of the Bible, we miss an opportunity for God to really connect with us where we are. Scandals of the Bible really look to connect you wherever you are with a God who is always present. I want your congregation, my home church, Allen Temple, and the congregation where I serve to understand that there is absolutely nowhere we can go that God is not present with us. And this invites you and and our pastor to engage in learning where God can be in the midst of things, scandals. I'm excited. I'm excited as well, and I appreciate you bringing that out, because that is exactly true, that, that when we look at the Bible, a lot of times it's hard for us to see ourselves, because we're hard on ourselves. We yes. judge ourselves. We think that we're the only ones who have issues or things that are not so pretty in our past or in our current situations. And when we read the Bible, we realize that the Bible is full of situations just like ours. I mean, I don't care who you are, I don't care your, your walk of life, you can find a piece of your story, whatever your story is, in the Bible. It's the most relevant book. And so we lift up this topic not to just get people to tune in and, and, and watch with this, this gimmicky uh, uh, title of Scandals in the Sacred, but we want you to realize and see yourself in the pages of Scripture because scandals are throughout our life and throughout the pages of this book. 
that the Bible is not simply, we talked about this, the Bible is not simply a, a, a prescription for life, Correct. but it's really a description of yes. life. Yes. And from that, we're able to see how to navigate the things of our world and the things of our life. And so when you look at the Bible, this, if you crack the pages of the Genesis open and immediately, I mean, you're met with scandals, right? I mean, immediately exactly. uh, you see them. I mean, what, what are the, some of the ones that you see immediately jumping off the pages? Well, the, the very first picture of human life interacting together is of a man and a woman. You can't get no more in touch with the world now than men and women and their interactions and how they are distracted and preoccupied with things that lead to some activity that gets the world in trouble. It starts out that way. Family struggles and scandals are how we get started. After a mother and a father, a husband and wife mess around and catch themselves in the scandal, then a brother we got blood on the pages, right? As soon as we get started, we got a murder plot. As, I mean, within the first few chapters of the Bible, I mean, how, how scandalous is that? And, and truth be told, we could go through, I mean, page after page throughout the Bible of scandal after scandal. And obviously for time, we're not able to do every scandal. But what we really want to look at is kind of some big ones, maybe some ones that aren't as known, as well known, but that really do serve as consequential turning points in the biblical narrative. And so today what we really want to lift up, first of all, is the story, or the scandal rather, <laughs> surrounding a person that you probably wouldn't think of as scandalous, and that is Noah. So we're starting in the book of Genesis, and we want to look at Noah's scandal. Now, we don't really think about Noah being scandalous, right? I mean, this is, this is the guy who built the ark. He was faithful. He was obedient. When nobody else believed that rain was coming, and he was faithful and believed and did what the Lord said, built it exactly how the Lord said do it. But even that Noah had a scandal. Um, and in fact, before we jump into that discussion, I want to just read it for you. We'll put it here on the screen. Noah, this is found in Genesis chapter 9, uh, verse 20. Uh, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out, found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves. Will he be to his brothers? He also said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Noah lived a total of 950 years. And then he died. So, Obviously, that's the, that's the passage, that's the scripture text, but break it down for us. What really just happened here? What did we just witness? Well, the, the first thing that we have to acknowledge is that is a wow factor, a father cursing a grandson. And I'd like to start there with, I, I don't know about you, but we have children. We're fortunate. We're blessed to have children. And I think that there are certainly some grandparents who are listening and watching us now. Now, my experience with grandparents is just a wow factor. The way that my parents engage with their grandchildren is completely different than the way that my parents engage with me. Uh, grandkids get away with everything. And for those who are looking and listening, you can go ahead and say, yeah, you're right. Grandchildren can do no wrong. The children are different. And so it's interesting to me with how grandparents love their children and how much joy grandchildren bring to their grandparents to see a grandfather curse a grandson is a wow factor. Wow. And for something that the grandson didn't even do. The That's son a great point. Did it. Ham did it. Ham is the one who allegedly did a disrespectful act. And his son bears, according to scripture, Canaan, which really is a land, bears the brunt of this out of order 
disrespect or behavior. So the wow factor starts out there with a family dynamic of grandfather cursing grandson and son being silent in the midst. Watch this. In the midst of his child being disciplined or cursed. So there's a lot going on to start there. And then you have to deal with the fact that the brothers were aware of what to do, but they quietly kept this information, this wisdom from the youngest brother who did something that has a behavior that we have deemed in scripture as disrespectful. So, so that sounds like what the real scandal is. I mean, there's a couple of scandals here, and we'll get to them because this is a layered scandal. Mm -hmm. um, but, but dealing first with the scandal of what, what Ham does to his father. Um, because obviously it seems on the surface uh, that this, this is somewhat of an innocent crime. Okay, so you saw your father. I mean, what's the big deal, right? To the point that, that, that he wakes up and curses Ham and well, Canaan mm -hmm. um, by extension. It, it seems almost as though the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Because on the surface, when we read it, it just doesn't, we don't necessarily, the scandalous nature of it doesn't pop out. There's more to what has happened with what Ham does or doesn't mm -hmm. do, mm -hmm. right? The fact that he saw him naked was not just the issue. Right. It's what he did after that, right? Mm -hmm. Or what he didn't do, right? Mm -hmm. He goes and tells somebody instead of helping to, I guess, preserve his father's dignity. Well, you know, what's interesting about this is we aren't privy to know exactly how Ham responds to his father. We do know he tells somebody because the brothers, the older brothers come and do what is considered orderly, mm -hmm. which is to cover their father. We don't know if, well, it's obvious Ham didn't know to do that. And it's obvious that the brothers come to do it because they haven't shared that knowledge with their younger brother. What's interesting here is to consider how this wow scandal takes place. Noah. Let's start there. When we talk about where to start, let's start with Noah. Noah is drunk, according to scripture. That's, that's the first real scandal. I mean, yeah, the, the yeah. man of God <laughs> the, is the, now drunk. The yeah. chosen one. Right. And, and we need to take a moment, if you want to identify yourself in this, chosen people have crisis. My God. Let's let's be clear on that, Pastor. Chosen I thought, I people. Thought Christians don't have scandals. Man, Christians got some of the best scandals, some of the most juicy scandals I, I've I ever seen. I thought once you got saved, there was no more scandal. That's when scandals start. I've discovered. Okay. The moment I make a decision to go after the will of God for my life, the moment I try to live right, the moment I try to follow the vision that God has for my life and for the legacy I want to live, all hell breaks loose. And I'm not certain if. People are really ready to embrace that scandal comes from being saved. My God, let's stop there. Before we get back to that, because I think, as you would say in your preaching, let, let's put a, a kickstand right there, a hermeneutical <laughs> kickstand right there. Right, right. Because that's really the, the essence of what we want to do in this study. Exactly. Is it, talk about the reality of the fact that all of us have some stuff that if it hit the front page of the news, if we can be real, I mean, the, the, the saved folk, the ones at St. John and Allen Temple, the ones who've been in the church their whole lives, we have some aspects of our lives that we want to keep hidden from, from, from plain sight. Yeah. And, and how do we love through that? Mm -hmm. How do we learn through that? How do we treat each other through that? Rather than getting excited because there's a new scandal to get on the phone and, and gossip about, how do we love people through these moments? It's interesting you mentioned this very powerful word that I'm growing to respect and love and enjoy, and that is love. How do we love people through scandal? I think for me, that's a hermeneutical kickstand. There's a theme in the biblical narrative, starting in the book of beginning Genesis, that raises itself if we pay attention, and that is how love is determined to bring everybody into order. We have to, as you said, Pastor, we have to love people through the scandal. Listen, I, I, I'd like for us to really look at this chosen man, and let's not be, let's not be um, um, so biased, chosen family, this chosen family of Noah to bring the new world into existence. God chose Noah to bring this new world into play. Noah is selected out of everybody in the world at that time. He's the first family. He is the first family. How about that? First family and scandal go hand in hand. How about that? And I want, I want churches to understand that. The reason that your pastor is qualified 
to take and lead and counsel and give guidance through your scandals, family, church family, community, is because often when the enemy is going to attack a congregation and a family of faith, they come for the head first. Because if they can get the head messed up, the body will follow. So this is why it's essential that you pray for your pastor. You pray for leadership in the church. You also need to give your pastor some relief, some time to to get away to refresh. Look, the first family is who the scandal hits. Your pastor and first families in leadership as well, not just preaching, but leadership officers need to be aware of this. We are the first in line to receive all kinds of attacks. And as we receive them, we learn to love one another through them. This is why leadership is qualified, if you will, to guide the congregation through. Because leadership understands what scandal does. Noah, first family, selected to do a great new move, comes out of this extraordinary experience the, the boat, which everybody knows about, right? The boat. The, the boat. We know that piece. We know that piece. 40 days, 40 nights, right? We know that. Which Steps. is not exact, but. Yeah. Now, here's something you may not know. Whenever you see the number 40 in the Bible, it is symbolic of a time period that scholars can't quite name to the date. 40 is symbolic of an extended period that scholarship has said we're going to bracket this period. That's just being real. So in essence, Noah and his family were trapped in a boat for a long period of time. Now, let's be real. It's pandemic, right? Mm. We have been going on, we going in two years, somewhat trapped with people we love. Mm. We have often talked about how it's impossible not to have confrontation, scandal, <laughs> With your family, and you love them, and you live with them. Think of Noah in a boat, not in a house, mm. not on dry land, but in a boat with not only his family, but animals. Oh my God. <laughs> I, want, I want people to identify with this man. You, you and I understand, and, and you should too, the pressure that can be produced by staying in closed quarters for a lengthy period of time. The pandemic, look, we're losing our mind, right? right? Folk losing their mind. Folk, if we're honest, you'll see the stats are going to say that there are more babies born. Yes. There are more marriages taking place. Yeah, I'm a witness. But also there's some divorces that take place because of the pandemic. Noah comes out of this boat having lost everything. And this this is the first we, we want you to draw. We want to bring you into the scripture and walk around in the scripture with us. Noah lost everything as a man, which in this time period was supposed to provide, to take care of. He loses all of that, and he steps on this new land with nothing. I don't know about you, but when you're hit with, you have family, and you have children and grandchildren that are looking to you, because watch this, you said God said come here. Mm. We here we in this mess because of you. You you talking about following <laughs> a God whom we don't know. You know this guy. We don't know. You got a relationship with this guy. We don't. But you said this is what it's gonna be. We we lost everything. All and our friends are gone. Friends gone. Life as we knew it is gone. Everything and now we on this land we've never What? And God says, Go forth and prosper. What? Be fruitful. Be what? The pressure is what I'm getting at. Scandals arrive in life. When pressure shows up, mm. pressure comes to Noah. And as pressure shows up in his life and his family, he needs to have an outlet. That's real. Ain't nothing, ho ain't nothing quote unquote holy about that. You need an outlet. Some of you all been smoking for years because that's your outlet. Some of us been drinking for years because that's our outlet. And you ain't got to say, man, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's real. Uh, some of us eat. As an outlet. And, and, and the pandemic has, look, they got this thing now where they said the pandemic 20, where people have gained 20 pounds. Got mine. You got, <laughs> people have gained weight because of what the pandemic, what they're eating and doing all kinds of, listen, when pressure comes, you need an outlet, a release. 
And Noah's release happens to be one of the oldest releases in human history, which is, as the scripture says, he's a man of the soil. He knows how to make wine, good wine, that stuff that'll get you really inebriated. And he has some. And it's so good to him, he gets drunk because he, he wants to forget the pressure. Mm. Scandals make you want to forget pressure. And Noah wanting to forget pressure, watch this, picks up a what I call a crutch, a, a substance abuse, an addiction, if you will, that causes him more trouble than good. Step one in a scandal, beware of how pressure will lead you to pick up habits that are not holy for you. My God. And, and, and I don't want people to misunderstand what we're saying. We're not condoning drunkenness. That's not what we're saying. No. But we want you to understand the human element mm -hmm. before we become judgmental and critical of Noah or others for whatever their scandal may be, to understand what led to it. Because we'll often say, well, I don't know how they could do that. They had everything. They do it. How did it? Have you ever been in their shoes? Pressure. Have you ever had to deal with the burden of the title that they hold? Pressure. Life looks great, but you don't know what it is like to have to deal with being in the spotlight. You, you don't know what it's like to have to do what they're dealing with that you don't see. You mentioned he was trapped mm -hmm. dealing with stuff that nobody else knew about. Nobody else comprehends And We read through the passage mm -hmm. and we kind of just brush over the fact that he spent this indeterminate amount of time lost everything, but, but was trapped and confined, lost everything, had to start anew. And while, yes, there's great opportunity, there, there's a great land of newness that's there to, to, to create a new world. The pressure of being the, the, the sojourner, if you, if you will, of that new world is, is, is inordinate. And he is trying to find, now, of course, we would say you need to find a positive outlet, you know, exercise and, and, and you know, volunteer, do good work, do something good, plant, plant a garden. And that's good. But what we want to deal with here is just the reality that sometimes our humanness can cause us to succumb to the pressures and do things that we regret. So, so we ought not be judgmental. We ought to be loving as a church, as Christians, and how we help people through their scandalous moments. You mentioned something, loving people through scandal. It, it brings to my attention that we need to ask this question of our congregations. Are you loving people through their scandals? Are we leading congregations to love people through their scandal? Love is, I, I shared this often now with the congregation that I'm privileged to serve, Love is the element, the weapon that God gives God's people to overwhelm any circumstance. It's love. How could Noah have been loved through this scandal? If, if Noah was a part of our congregation, and we hear it, because it's going to be on. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, right now, there's a Noah-type situation scandal going on in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. Urban uh, Modern messed up. He done slipped and fell in it. Uh, and what's interesting is how, how is the community, the family, going to love him into living healthier? Love. So we, we need to wrestle with this scandal of love. Like, do we serve congregations that are loving? Is the atmosphere of our congregation an atmosphere where love overwhelms scandal? And, and it's interesting, because as you were speaking, my, my mind also went to the fact that we not only have to love others through scandal, mm -hmm. we need to love ourselves through scandal. Wow. Because we can be hard on ourselves. Yes. And, and we will carry the guilt. Because mm -hmm. now, as, as, as you were thinking, I was thinking about the fact that part of, I think, what made Noah so irate mm -hmm. when he, quote, found out what his youngest son had done to him was not only that you saw me naked, I'm embarrassed that I was drunk. I'm embarrassed that my son has seen me like this mm -hmm. in this state of, of being inebriated, of being unclothed, vulnerable, vulnerable, at my lowest. Mm -hmm. and, and part of his cursing him is, 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 is out, of, out of anger, obviously, you know, out of embarrassment. And what do we know about anger? Anger is the secondary emotion of hurt. And you hit it dead on the nail. He's embarrassed that I'm the provider. I'm the one who led us to where we are. And now 
I'm in a situation where I was in a position of vulnerability to my sons that I didn't want to be in. That's that's big. And, you know, and it's funny you mentioned about from a place of hurt. You know, mm. I think I share with you my I, my therapist one will ask me sometimes, "Are you saying that from a position of clarity or from a position of hurt?" Mm. And that's heavy because I think part of what Noah does here is he responds out of hurt, which makes us even more scandalous. Th this, is, this is what's interesting. And here, here is the real crux of where we're, we're digging into this family. We're trying to bring you into to this experience. Noah speaking out of hurt. He's drunk. He's drunk. He's hung over. He wakes up with a hangover. Hello, have you ever had a hangover? Don't answer that. <laughs> Have you ever had an experience where you've been so intoxicated with the the spirit of the wine that you can't think clearly? He's hung over and he does something in a hungover state. State he curses his grandson, his line. Now I need to be clear: a curse from a drunk person is not really a curse because they're not in their right mind. Mm -hmm. Think about that. How many times have we acted out of anger, which was hurt, and said things that were certainly not what we wanted to say? Noah is an example of how scandal comes out of what? Pressure, but also out of speaking from a place of hurt and not a place, as, as Pastor says, clarity. I think we need to look at that closely. Are you speaking out of a place of hurt or are you speaking out of a place of clarity? My God. Now, now, from that point, and I know we have to wrap up, because when he speaks from this place of hurt, he curses Canaan, mm -hmm. right? Which then becomes consequential, not just for Canaan mm -hmm. and his family, but for the generations that will come and in the biblical narrative. Explore yeah. that real quick as we close this out. Okay, I want you to understand something. That, that scholars have really been gripped with trying to understand this. Matter of fact, Martin Luther, everybody know, not Martin Luther King. <laughs> Martin Luther, the German theologian who... 95 Theses. Yes, okay attack 95 Theses on the doors of Littenberg, Martin Luther, who started, who is basically a faith group is named after him. Lutherans are named after Martin Luther. Martin Luther says in his own writings about this text, get this, he says, I don't quite understand how it's considered a curse when this grandson and the generation of descendants from this grandson actually have more than any other of the grandchildren. Canaan becomes the most prosperous and the most sought after land of any of the descendants of, of Noah. So how is it a curse? That's a God factor there. God will always take what we mess up and curse and turn it in to something that's greater than we could imagine. Martin Luther says, let's, let's think about that. Was it really a curse? And I need to share this. Ham, it, it's often been said that this is how black people have um, been missed. Please, please, please clear that up. Let, let, let's clear this up. I need you to understand that everything in the Bible from Genesis unto Acts is black and brown. You don't see any Eurocentric tendency or uh, melanin, if you will, until Acts, which is Paul being converted. Everything else is black and brown. So please be aware that it wasn't that Ham is a black man and the rest of the descendants are not. Absolutely not. Ham is just like Noah, black and brown. Here is something I need us to understand, and we'll, we'll deal with this even more next week. But please understand that it wasn't until the 19th century that people tried to explain slavery through this text. This is where all of the mistakes come. This is where the misinterpretation of scripture come. First, we can't speak for God. And I got to ask this question as we close. Does God speak in this? A man, a human who is what? Drunk, hurt, embarrassed, speaks a curse. God never curses. Now that's something for us to explore. God never curses. And and look, what's so interesting is in scripture today, it's Noah said, blessed be everybody else. But God never speaks of that. We never hear, this is what God said. 
All we know is that Canaan became the greatest. Scandals often produce some of the greatest blessings in your life and in our life. But just, just consider that reality. The, the core of where black people kind of cringe with this scripture is because in the early 19th century is where people try to justify slavery by using this text. And, and that's, like you mentioned, the misuse of scripture, which is why it's very important and critical for us to understand what scripture really says, mm -hmm. to do the study, to, to be careful about what you, who you listen to, because people can use the Bible said to say anything. Um, and they will. And they have. Uh, and so that's why we have to be very careful. Um, there, there's so much here in this text. We want to be respectful of your time and our format for this. And so we're going to stop there for today. Uh, we, we probably will pick back up at the beginning of next week to kind of close this out because there's some pieces there, uh, especially with what you just brought up about does God speak in this. But hopefully what you have seen thus far is that scandals are a part of life. Scandals are a part of the Bible, yes. But we can see ourselves in all of this. And through that, God still loves. God still blesses. Even at your lowest point, even in the most embarrassing moments, God still lives. God still moves. God still blesses. And so we ought to be encouraged by that. I'm excited about what we're doing here. I'm, I'm excited about what we're I'm really doing. excited. Listen, I need to say, uh, Pastor Cooper has given the email address for his congregation to share questions so that we can grab those questions. I want to do the same. St. John, you know the email address to the church. You can use that email to send questions so that we can engage with your questions as well. Or text your pastor. Just text pastor and we can get those questions in to hear and try to grapple and grapple with them over the next few weeks. I'm excited. That's where the fun's going to come in. Yes, we to hear you. With the text. We wrestle. wrestle with your challenges of faith. And it helps us, watch this, to know where we need to preach more. Exactly. Where you're weak, we want to strengthen your faith. Well, that wraps it up for this first edition. Hopefully you've been blessed. Hopefully this works for you. We're excited about what God's doing in this season. You have a blessed, safe week. And know God loves you, and so do we.